It's a race week, Tim, and even though it is uh, cold and, and my hair is a mess thanks to the wind outside, I do appreciate that. Thank you, wind. Uh, it was like beautiful in Toronto yesterday. Now it's cold and, and gray. Um, we do have a race week, and when it's a race week, it's always sunny. Uh, Suzuka is on the uh, calendar. Uh, we're all very excited, and Tim, you know, I think the thing that, that is so interesting about this particular race, obviously the focus on Yuki Tsunoda, but I think on the uh v carb or racing bulls or whatever you want to call it team there have been rumors upon rumors upon rumors everything from they've made daniel ricardo uh, a a deal that if he doesn't improve his performance liam lawson's in to liam lawson saying listen red bull if you can't find me a a spot i i appreciate it i want to race for you but i'm gonna race for somebody else um there's so much going on here tim with this team and of course Obviously, being in Japan, being Yuki Tsunoda's home turf, he's going to want to put in a good race. So I, I think I want to start with the Daniel Ricciardo rumors just because I know that you can pretty much refute them, right? All the reports that people are saying about um, them giving a um, some sort of ultimatum are BS? I mean, you like he has to be given a, a length of time before the team can evaluate simply anything. I mean, he's Daniel Ricciardo. He's a race winner. He's won Grand Prix in formula one and to sit there and, and to say that you've got X, Y, Z number of races to get something in line is, yeah, that's not totally accurate. I mean, it's, it is the Red Bull racing program. So we know that at any moment, Anything can happen, Adam. Like, we know that. That's not new. Uh, but at the same time, he is Daniel Ricardo. He does bring a wealth of experience. Has the last few years for him been a bit of a struggle? Well, yeah, they have. But you have to also take into consideration what he's done in the past. I think one of the things for Daniel and the team will get a better understanding of what his issues actually are is the more he drives the car, the more they're going to figure things out for Laurent Mackey's. He needs to give Daniel Ricardo a better car. And he's even admitted that that's the mm-hmm. guy who is running the team now down at RB. And so that Adam is kind of like where you kind of have to start. You have to start with Laurent Mackey's. And then once he says something like that, that's where the leadership is with this, with this team at the moment. And so once you start to hear something different from him, that's when you know things may change for Daniel Ricardo. Well, so Laura Mackey's made a, a, a point in an interview this week or this past week. Sorry, Tim. I forget that it's uh, Tuesday already. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was saying that, listen, Daniel has revealed some of the weaknesses of the car to them. Do you believe that he's actually doing that? Or do you think that that's publicity spin to kind of take the heat off of Daniel? No, definitely. Like he, like I met with... Laurent for uh, one of the first times in Bahrain a couple months ago, and he's pretty transparent, and which is fairly, you know, it's it, it's a common place for that position as a team principal. You you kind of have to be because reporters know other people within the teams who can get the information when they need it, like top top line reporters. And so, yeah, I mean, he's telling us he's telling us these things because that's what he feels and that's what they need to do. And I mean, at the end of the day, like it, it hasn't like, it hasn't been great for Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Like he had a decent race in Bahrain. Um, But I think at the end of the day, you have to give this more time considering it's a new car. And yeah, Yuki Tsunoda has like really gotten to grips with things quite quickly, which is nice to see. And it's something we'll talk about in a minute, but I think for, I think when you got a driver like Ricardo on your team, you have to listen to him and you have to take into consideration what he is saying because he brings that wealth of experience at him. Like it's just so important. I mean, you just, you can't, I can't stress enough how important it is to have experience in this era of formula one. And, and why is that Tim? The cars are so complex now. And the fact that, you know, you have Ricardo who's been in formula one forever has driven so many iterations of race car that he's able to pinpoint weaknesses that a driver maybe like Yuki Tsunoda may not be able to feel or find. For Ricardo, he's been able to go through all of that and to accumulate that wealth of experience and knowledge is extremely important now because you're dealing with a regulation that is so technical in the way that it keeps the field 
bunched together, close closer together. Teams can't just run away from each other now. They're in a fight for like tenths of a second now instead of seconds. Mm-hmm. So you need that wealth of experience that just unlocks those tiny little milliseconds of performance that eventually, Adam, end up to bigger, bigger pieces of performance. Now, granted, Yuki Sonoda is doing really well. So people will yeah. say, well, I mean, he's obviously not doing that much, but he actually would be doing other things to what Yuki's doing. And it may not be something that we see on the television but it is something that the engineers see behind the scenes because they're able to un, uh, look at those that layer of data. So they're, they're, you know, I look at the comments on Daniel Ricardo's Instagram posts or his, or tweets about Daniel Ricardo, and oh, yeah. people are people those, are man. losing their minds. It's three oh, races man. in, right? Yeah. And and I think the the you get basically two two sides. You get the side that thinks he's washed, and you get the side that's going, "Hey, it's getting harder to defend you." Um. Uh. Do you think that Daniel Ricardo's washed? No. I mean, definitely so not. So if like, anybody... D- 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 define, if any- hold on a second, I'm sorry. Define yeah. washed. As like, in can't race at Formula One levels anymore. No. I don't no. believe that whatsoever. If, 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 if Ricardo's able to figure out what's going on, if the team is able to help him sort that out, then I think he's going to be able to get back to that level. I think... One of the big things, Adam, I think that's 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 hampered Ricardo. Actually, I shouldn't say one of those things. I should say like a multiple of things would be simply, you know, leaving the Red Bull program, which is fine. You got to do that. You got to go and chase something else if you know that you're not going to be the number one driver at the that that at that team. Which we all know that that wasn't going to happen once Max arrived on that team. Going to Renault spending two years there, doing a decent job when he was at Renault. And that's something I think people forget about is just how good he was at that team. And he was he, actually... He finished fifth in the driver's standings. Yeah, he was very strong. He yeah. was very strong when he was with Renault. Going to McLaren, and then you've got a struggle there with a car that was always sort of on a knife's edge where Lando Norris could actually extract performance because of the car being on that knife's edge. And that's where Lando can, can operate the best sometimes. And Mm -hmm. Daniel just couldn't. Then you've got a regulation change, right? Yeah. Into 2022 where he's having trouble, not only with the confidence because of the car, but the same characteristics from that older generation of car carries through. So you're still having to not only figure out that, find balance on that knife's edge, try to apply what you do to the car. And at the same time, I don't think the regulation really suited the way uh, Ricardo likes to hustle a race car. Right. right. And I think that's extremely important for people to understand. It's just for a driver to figure out where he was so used to the way uh, the car generated performance for so many, so many years to a car that now generates performance in a different way. It's heavier. It's harder to rotate. You can't just get it on the nose like you like to have it. So you have to sort of develop a different set of tools. You have to try and engineer the car more towards what you're doing. And I think for Ricardo, that's something that uh, I think that he really needs to work on is that that part of it, trying to understand the car in an engineering way to get it closer to what he likes to do. That's um, something that Max has been able to do. Like absolutely, been well, able to, do it. to great effect too. Yeah. He's been spectacular. Um, Tim, you know when we talk about that team, obviously Yuki Sonoda is going to be under the spotlight. There's going to be a lot of media, um, a lot of you know, just like Daniel in Australia. It's actually funny that they go from Australia to Japan, right? You know, right next to each other. Um, how do you think the pressure of Suzuka and and the uh, uh, just an amazing amount of support for Yuki Sonoda? Sometimes that can work against you. How do you think he'll? handle that this year. Yeah, I think he's I think he's going to be good. Like I think I think Sonoda's in a different headspace Adam. Like it, I I always I like now seeing Yuki do well because I think he's that perfect example of what I talk about when I say drivers need young drivers need time in this iteration of Formula 1. Mm-hmm. Like it takes a long time for young drivers to really, really show what they can do. So 
Yuki showed a ton of promise when he was in Formula 2. And so the team is like, okay, we're going to bring him up and we're going to put him in our junior team and we're going to see how he does. And they put him on these like one plus one deals where it's like, okay, well, you got, you got one year and then we'll, we maybe we'll pick up your option. And for him, it's all about trying to learn, understand, like they had to move him to Italy. They had to get his training program uh, changed differently because I think they felt they they weren't unlocking enough of what his potential actually was. And then for Yuki to understand and to learn the tire, to learn the uh, the nuances of of how a Formula One car changes over time, that's experience. Right. And that is so crucial for a young driver to to learn. And it I always say, give a driver in Formula One who's new, give them three years always. Always say that. And I think Yuki is that example because we're now seeing in his third year him unlocking his own potential. And that's where that experience comes in, Mm -hmm. where you know now that, oh, the car's doing this. That means I got to do this to get to this. Right. And he's impressed a lot of people through three races. Again, I know it's only three races, but... Uh, Yuki's star is for sure on the rise right now. And in Formula One, all it takes is three more races and then you're at the bottom again. Like, it really, <laughs> it's such a funny sport that way. Like, it's it's what have you done for me lately? I don't care that you won a championship three years ago. You suck. You're terrible. Um, and, it's you know, it's a, these are elite, insane drivers, like top 20 in the world. Um, I, I wanted to tell you, it's so funny that we're talking about, you know, teams that are not mega point scores, right? Because there is really a have and a have not on the grid right now. Basically from Aston Martin up, you got lots of points from, uh, from Red Bull, uh, you know, racing bulls down, you have almost none. Um, but I think that's where some of these great stories are because oftentimes when teams are being successful, there's not a whole lot to talk about unless you're Red Bull and there's a lot of drama off track and we can get to that. Although there isn't as much lately. One thing I want to, I, I really quickly wanted to touch on is the fact that, uh, the, you know, the now formerly Sauber, I don't even know if we can call them Sauber anymore because they've been bought out. Uh, but the Audi team, which Audi now owns the full shares of it, they, they were going to do 75%. They now are going to own a hundred percent. Um, they've had pit stop issues, big ones. Uh, Valtteri Bottas was held up, I think 40 seconds in the last race, just because of a wheel nut problem. And it seems as though they're going to continue to have these issues. Um, how hard is it to fix pit stop issues? It's not something you often see at Formula One. Yeah, no, at that it's level. A, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good point. It, it sucks for 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 Val, for Valtteri as well because I mean he would have he would have scored I think pretty decent points in uh, yeah. in Australia too if he didn't have the issue that that they had. And I think also on top of that, I mean, it shows us that hey, maybe Sauber's not not as bad as we kind of thought they were, which is you know, an interesting subject because we, I think we all kind of thought that, you know, the likes of uh, Sauber, Alpine, Haas, Williams, they were going to be in their own sort of tier way down at the bottom, really far away from that next level of, uh, of teams. But now we're starting to see that actually that, that gap is not actually that big. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's an interesting thing, but for, for pit stops, it's, uh, it's like, it's like a ballet almost, right? Everybody has to know what they're doing when the cars come in. These guys practice um, pit stops ad nauseum at them. Like you'll go to a Grand Prix and they have pit stop practice. And that's what they do. They practice pit stops and they do it again and again and again and again and again until that time of practice is over and you you have to shut it all down. It's funny because that's one of the things that when I get to go to Grand Prix um, and I get to tour around the garages and stuff like that, you I always go to pit stop practice to kind of see how uh, this sort of symphony of of tires coming off and tires going on and limbs and bodies and all yeah, the other just, things, yeah. And you're kind of looking at it and you're just seeing the mass of humanity that's like you know <laughs> ripping things off and putting things on, and you're like, it passes like that so fast you can't even see what everybody's doing but you can always see when it's out of rhythm and you can see when someone screws up and that's the part i like because you see maybe three corners of the car with 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 all of these uh crew members on each point of the car and you see that one point that just makes a little mistake 
And then the whole thing is, uh, it just gets thrown off. The pit stop goes from being like two seconds to 10, like yes. nobody's business. It's the most fascinating thing to, to watch and to see. And it's something that these teams always practice and they're always practicing it. They're practicing it in the off season to maintain that rhythm. And then once you get in season, they're, they're, they're practicing, practice, practicing it on Thursdays or practicing on Fridays and Saturdays as well. Like it's, it's really cool to see Adam. Like I always take videos of it and post it on my social media, social media. Cause it's just do, awesome. Do you, have you ever done a pit stop? Like not in the driver's Never. seat? Oh Never. yeah, 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 yeah. Done, done a, done a pit stop in, in driver's seat, but nothing like F one, right? That that's like another sort of that's another level, right? Like that. That's you've like, never been out there with the the wheel guns, you know, pulling everything off and. No, I've never done that. Like I like driven into the box and and like gotten gotten a change, but that change is not two seconds. It was you know it was like thirty, forty, fifty seconds because it was a bigger car and all that kind of stuff. But right. that must be painful, by the way, waiting thirty, forty seconds. I mean, like for a driver, like I'm always thinking about hitting your marks because the driver ha plays a crucial role in the car coming into the box and like coming out of the box, right? Like it's, you have to hit your marks as well. Like there's little lines drawn on the ground that the driver can sometimes look for. Uh, for F1, it's a little different because they have the front jack. So literally you're kind of, you're coming down pit lane and you're pulling into the front jack. I think for the driver in that respect, you're... You're making sure you're sort of hitting the brake at that mo same moment that the car is hitting the jack because you don't want to run your jack guy over. You know? Right. Like, like, dude, I was in, when I was in, uh, I I've seen this a number of times and George Russell almost like absolutely pancaked his, his front jack guy when we were in Bahrain during testing. Like, and I was standing like behind, I was standing behind like the front jack guy and even I kind of like jumped out of the way to be like, oh God, like he's going to run all of us over. But like, you know, credit to the to the people who are who are running the front jack because that's actually that's actually not an easy thing because you got a car coming at you at like whatever 50 60 kph and it's like yeah and it's like a like on a dime it's like a five ten million dollar car too like it's not a cheap car <laughs> no more than that yeah but, but yeah like, i mean adam just picture it like a car coming at you at that speed oh it's crazy i can't even i can't imagine um uh speaking of tim uh, it looks as though, and this is this story is bubbling under the surface, and it's wild. Williams obviously only raced one car in uh, uh, in Melbourne because of the you know the fact that Alex Albon crashed. This was widely publicized. They gave him Logan Sargent's car. I think he did the best he could with it. Yeah. Um, you know, without any protection out there too, without any teammates. Yeah, but. From what we heard last week, James Bowles was saying he was fairly confident it would be rebuilt for Suzuka. Fairly confident. Fairly confident, yeah. Which like, is, yeah. again, like, <laughs> I mean, James Bowles doesn't speak in absolutes most of the time. He yes. doesn't. No. But that did leave room for maybe it's not ready. What do you know? Yeah. So the so soon as so soon as uh, Alex had his crash, right? They they investigate the car take a look at it and it essentially like it's it's tubbed so that means that the chassis the tub of the car the safety cell whatever you want to call it that goes to the dumpster now it's it's done and you can actually uh you can actually fix if it's not too bad you can actually fix them now which is interesting because back in back in my day like back when i was racing it's kind of like you tubbed a car, it's not coming back. Like that's it. And you've basically bought yourself a brand new <laughs> broken chassis that cool. <laughs> you can take home with you and you own that now and, and you pay for the crash damage. It's a little different in F1, but it's um it got shipped back to Williams headquarters and arrived last Monday. So following the Australian Grand Prix, it, it arrived in, um, Williams headquarters the next day at like two in the morning. Okay. And they were able to start to work on it as soon as it arrived. Like Val's had uh, crew members at Williams HQ to get to receive the car at two in the morning and start working on it. So they've been working on this thing. Uh, and we heard from James last week. He said that, you know, that, that the car should be ready to go for Japan. Uh, but it doesn't sound like Adam, they're going to have a, a backup again. It's so, right. like whatever. And that's another level of, of problem. And maybe some people might not understand the fact that 
once you, for Williams, that doesn't have that uh, infrastructure that we've always talked about, the strength of that, you're basically holding up uh, having new parts developed and you're also holding up development of potentially a brand new chassis because you're fixing old parts mm -hmm. on your race car. And so that for Williams kind of throws a wrench into those things. So maybe they don't get an upgrade, you know, for, for Imola because of what has happened here and the fact that they're trying to build a, a third car, um, that is such a huge issue for a team like Williams out of because it just, it slows everything down and then you don't follow through with your upgrade schedule. And so uh, it sounds like they're going to have two cars for Japan. That shouldn't be the issue. That shouldn't be an issue. What the issue will be is potentially that third chassis. And uh, do you think that the owner of Williams, Dorlison Capital, do you think they, do you think they look at this and go, okay, like we have a really valuable property here. The asset is on the rise. The team mm -hmm. performance is on the rise. We got a good driver in Alex Albon. We're still waiting to see on Logan Sargent. We know he's a good driver. He's in F1, but you know, can he perform at the F1 levels? And you know, we got a good team principal who is leading the way for this new era of Williams. Are we supporting them enough? Are we investing enough so that these guys can perform to the level that we need them to? And I mean, it's, it does sound like Doralton has, has given them that investment. Like it, like I remember when we were in, uh, we were at the British Grand Prix, and I remember James, you know, talking to us about uh, simply it wasn't the case of not having enough money. Like he felt that they have enough money to inject into infrastructure, so capital expenditure was a huge issue and huge topic at that time, and that's something that James was fighting for um, within the regulation because he had gone in and seen like we have equipment that's so old that yes. it can fail at any time. And he's like, I'm used to coming from when he was at Mercedes, he's like, I'm used to coming from a factory that had the best equipment and had backups of that best equipment. And the thing with these regulations and uh, what you can spend in your factory is almost like a cost cap there too was the fact that they can only spend so much. And for James, it wasn't even close. Like it wasn't enough. Like they, some pieces of equipment were costing the amount of what the CapEx was at. And so for right. James, he had to go in lobby fight for um, some room that he could actually just say, Hey, look, like we need to invest X, Y, Z dollars. We have that money. And so Adam, that's coming from Doralton, right? Like, right. I mean, Doralton and and is, he was successful in that lobbying, money. right? They did kind of lift some of those yeah, caps. Yeah, they did. For, yeah, yeah. So the yeah. capital expenditure for them has expanded, which he's gone out and, and started to get new and better equipment. It's just getting it, bringing it in, integrating it into it. their system. And that takes years, right? Yeah, and, and I think it takes years for, for engineers to to fully understand things sometimes, yeah, that's, right? It's that's the, a great point. These are not good. You know, it's not like um, – it's, you know, it's funny – Back in the day, the way manufacturers of, of anything, not cars, but anything, looked at where they would put a factory is, does the population in that area understand how yeah. to build what we're trying to build? Yeah. Are they educated on that? And, yeah. and to a certain extent, they still do that. Um, so, you know, it, it does take a little bit of time for these engineers to kind of figure it out and how to maximize their contribution through that. And so, that it, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Now, Tim, uh, one of the things that uh, in the salacious rumor department, uh, which I love about Formula One and which we will always cover, uh, is Fernando Alonso. Um, there is There was talk this week, and again, you got to remember that this Spanish language newspapers, Italian language, Dutch language, French language, British papers, they're all known for being very, very salacious, headline grabbing, pulling people in. So you never know what to trust, but... Fernando Alonso's contract is up at the end of the year. He's still racing great as of this point. He has said on record, I got to figure out at the end of the year if I'm still, like, if I still want to do this, because it's a lot. Um, the word is now that his agent, and I believe that's Flavio uh, Briatore, yep. um, is, <laughs> is pushing hard for that second Red Bull seat. Now, whether or not, no, that would, that would track with who Flavio Briatore is. And if you don't know who that is, I, you know, we don't have time to go into it, but the guy's is a pretty big name in Formula One and has yeah, been yeah. a part of a lot of stuff. Um, Flavio, it, it tracks with something that Flavio would do. Um, what do you think about a Fernando Alonso Red Bull 
union? And and do you think it's possible? Uh, I think well, like Adam, you, like you know, Formula One, anything's possible, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I um. I just don't know if he would want to play number two to Max because honestly, anybody who's going there, that's the situation. That's what you're in. And you I don't care. It... Like, I don't care how good you are, right? Like, you have to remember that it's kind of like that's sort of Helmet Marco's sort of area when it comes to like the drive. And Max is like the, the favorite. And it's kind of how are you going to, no matter how good you are, how are you going to, to usurp him? How are you going to usurp Max Verstappen? Well, I mean, he's Fernando Alonso. Would he not believe that he could? I don't think anybody could, like, usurp Max at this moment. He's just, one, he's, you know, he's he's at the top of his game, right? Yeah. Two, yeah. like, he has the backing from the whole team, the whole team. Like, this is kind of why Daniel Ricciardo said, see you guys, like, I'm going to go down to Renault, try my hand there, see what happens, because I know I'm not going to be the number one driver here. Mm-hmm. Like I think Red Bulls kind of built their program up so you have that number one driver, then you have that sort of one B two A driver who will just be behind your number one and is going to be able to protect and do whatever and help you win a constructors championship and then help your number one win a, a driver's title. And so I just don't like uh, I've I've seen the stories. I I don't know if I necessarily uh, think that that would be a great spot for Fernando. But again, like Flavio has been seen with Toto Wolf and, you know, I saw Flavio speaking with a bunch of the Aston Martin people when we were in Bahrain. And so like, so he's, he's make he's, he's uh, making the rounds. He's making right? the rounds and, and as he should, that's what a good agent does. Right. Yeah, and I, sure. and I wonder, Tim, you know, is 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 does Fernando become an option for Red Bull if they lose Verstappen? Because as much as that chat has quiet quieted down, that would it has more. That would make more sense. That I would make more sense, and that that hasn't that hasn't gone away, right? Like that, you know, that's still entirely possible. We have Max Verstappen on on, uh, on you know commenting today, and you sent this to me, Tim, uh, about the the big risk that they've taken for 2026 in developing their own powertrain with Ford. Um, obviously Ford wanted to get back into the sport. They were in it with Jag up, I think till 2004, 2005. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And then and, Red Bull, and never a great Red performer. Bull took them over. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting because it'd be Ford coming back to its old team. But, uh, um, you know, there is a risk inherent in that. And I think Max needs to consider that. hundred percent. This is something Adam that kind of came up mid last, last season, a big part of it was I can't remember the exact uh, wording that Verstappen had used and same with like Christian Horner when they were in the FIA press conference. But essentially it, it sounded like once the engine got to a certain uh, threshold of speed, same with the battery, you know, they would have essentially every team was going to have trouble keeping that top end speed going down a really long straightaway because the battery would run out of juice. Mm-hmm. And essentially, it's like, okay, well, you're going to be lifting off when you're on a straightaway when in racing, you never do that. And this right. is what you would be doing. And it kind of raised the eyebrow of like Total Wolf and everybody else being like, whoa, like you're having that problem? Like we're not having that problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's where this whole thing sort of started to, to, to snowball. But the rumor is, is that, you know, Red Bull powertrains, uh, which is also something that's going to be new for them. Mm-hmm. building their own power unit uh, is having issues with the 2026 engine regulation. Um, now, for those who don't know, you know, Red Bull never made engines before, ever. They always bought them. Um, and in 2026, they made the decision that they were going to open up their own power unit sort of supply chain and build their own engines, power units uh, from 2026 onwards so they never would run into issues again where they got into it with uh, a, an engine developer or a power unit manufacturer and and not have a competitive um engine and that's something that they faced in the 2020 2014 season all the way through to honda came on board yeah so the renault years yeah so for this particular team they went and they opened up their own power unit um building facility 
and you know christian horner went out and and really uh grabbed uh some very creative individuals from other teams to help with that to help them bring that online to help them build the engines and ford sort of came on board to assist them in a way it's not it's not a full-blown uh works division you know it's still going to be a red bull powertrains air quotations with ford badging on it and who knows where they could go with that right like could, could they start to get into the uh automotive sector could they make cars mm. could they make uh engines or hybrid engines for road going vehicles could they you know, sell those to car companies who maybe don't want to develop a hybrid power unit, but just want to maybe lease something from it. I mean, there's so many possibilities here that this could potentially open up for them as a business. So it, it, it was interesting to hear when they were talking about that last mm -hmm. year. And that's sort of where this story has come from with like, hey, is Red Bull going to have issues with their own power unit that they're going to bring to the track in 2026? And then if you're Max Verstappen, how does that affect you? Do you go, you know, you know, you're on this roll of winning championships. Does that now throw a wrench into your, into your plans? Right. And we've seen it happen. We've yeah. seen it happen. Regulations change. Mercedes has never been the same. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. That's a great point, Adam. I mean, like when, when you look at it, it's like regulation changes have, they've either excelled some teams or they've really like held them back and pulled them back. And it'll, it, it's an interesting topic because when we've seen, I mean, all of the things that have happened at, at Red Bull over this season so far, and, you know, you have the grumblings of, of Max and his dad and everything that was going on there. And then, you know, people start to factor in like, oh, what's the engine program looking like now? Is that also something that could deter Max from, you know, fulfilling his contract with, with the team? I mean, these are all questions that we don't have answers to. I think at the end of the day, you know, Verstappen will... Well, there's probably a 1% chance, Adam, that, that, that the Max ends up leaving or something, right? Like, it's right. not, you're still going to win. You're still going to be in com competition for a championship in 2025. So. Exactly. And that's really what it's about. Yeah, um, Tim, you know, one of the things that uh, McLaren has been doing, uh, and Ferrari, Ferrari and McLaren, I think, have been two of the more aggressive teams in terms of updating who they're bringing on board. They want real talent, and you could see it come out in both of their cars, Ferrari and McLaren cars, I think, you know, over the last couple of years have been a pretty steady trajectory, especially since, you know, Fred Vasseur took over in Ferrari and Andrea Stella in, uh, in, at McLaren, right? There's been a real uptick, you know, both of those teams are really competitive again. Uh, one thing that, that I think everybody was really excited about, if you really know the technical side of things, um, Technical director David Sanchez and McLaren have parted ways. Now, Sanchez started his role three months ago, and he was hired from Ferrari. Uh, Andrea Stella attributed to a misalignment in expectations for the departure. What do you know about this story? Because it's a lot more interesting than what it looks like. Yeah, and this is a bit of breaking news that we're actually getting to, Adam. Like when we went when we've gone to like tape this, we've kind of just gotten this in the last few hours of of um this uh technical shakeup that's happened at, at McLaren. Now, David Sanchez, um he was a big part of of Ferrari and their technical department and uh, even their aerodynamic department as well at that team and McLaren went to great lengths to pull him away from Ferrari and have him at their team. Uh, I believe it was last February. So we're going back to like 2023 when they've, they were able to sort of complete that deal. Sanchez then put on gardening leave up until January of this year when he started to work at McLaren under his role. Now, now one of the things that, um, McLaren does now. So when, when Andreas Seidel was at the team, they had James Key, mm -hmm. who was a huge part of, of making their car. Seidel leaves, goes to, uh, goes down to Sauber is now running that is now running that bringing Audi in. And then you've had Andreas Stella be promoted into the team principal role. You had James Key then leave the team and Stella, uh, implements an interesting technical, um, Technical makeup. Now it's it's sort of like a three pillared approach to 
uh, uh, putting a race car t together. Now, if you think of it sort of this way, there was a technical director used to be one person overseeing the entire development of a race car. And now some teams, McLaren included, have gone to this sort of three pillared approach. Alpine just did it. Um, Bruno Famine just, just did that like last month has set this up something similar to what Andrea Stella has done. Essentially it takes away a lot of the workload from one person and it spreads it across three different um, people in three different de departments. Now what they had developed was Peter Pedromo who had been at McLaren for a really long time, very talented uh, guy. He would be the technical director of aerodynamics. Then you had Rob Marshall who they pulled away from Red Bull just recently, mm -hmm. and they put him in a role of uh, of technical director for uh, engineering and design. And then David Sanchez was to fill out that tree as technical director of, of car concept and performance. And it just didn't sound like from the, the quotes we were given, like things were... Um, really gelling well with with the team and and what they wanted Sanchez to do uh, and like you had said uh, they were quoted as as it being sort of a um, a misalignment uh and it sounded like it was they all agreed David included that it it's just best to part ways with what we what we're doing so David could go and look for another job within formula 1 something that that he would be really good at not saying that he wouldn't be good at this position. I think he may have been looking for just a little bit more, maybe a little bit more in terms of challenge, maybe mm -hmm. the position that he was sort of coming into wasn't going to be challenging enough. So that means that McLaren's had to sort of restructure this whole thing again. So you mm -hmm. have Rob Marshall, who was the guy they pulled away um, uh, from, from Red Bull. Mm -hmm. He switches from, the technical director of uh, engineering and design to chief designer. They promote Neil Hoodley. He goes from, uh, he, he leaves the lower ranks. He gets promoted as like a, he's basically deputy to, to Rob Marshall's former role, technical director in engineering. And then Andre Stella, who's a team principal, he's going to assume some, some of David Sanchez's uh, workload. And if we think about, all the stuff that Stella has to do already by running an actual Formula One team at him. Like he's now adding more onto his plate while they go out and they search for someone who can, who can pick up that workload. So it's, it, you know, we start the season McLaren's in an okay position. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but, but the car doesn't look like it's taken a huge step from what it was last season. And then we get into this season and then we hear that like, Hey, we're not going to have updates until a little bit later on down the road. Uh, kind of sort of the writing on the wall here that that whatever it was that they had tried or attempted to do uh, with Sanchez in that role has kind of held them back with with updates to the car and all of these other kind of things. So it's a uh, oh boy, it, yeah, it sounds like it anyways. Now we'll learn more as this week sort of progresses and and uh, Stella talks to the media and we'll we'll get more out of a, an understanding of what what was going on there and. And how has this affected their development? Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a big loss for them and the the efforts that they went to 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 get him. That that was is pretty huge. Uh, even though some people may look at this and not think of it as a as a story internally at McLaren, it's a big deal. Like that's a very big deal for them. Well, I I, I didn't. I, I honestly, I walked in here thinking, ah, it's not that big of a story. Yeah. And uh, and you know, you kind of turned me around on it because I think the context of the situation is key. Now, who is the greatest technical director of the last twenty five years in Formula One? Oh my gosh! I mean, it depends what we want to. We're talking label. about building a car. Yeah, it depends what we want to label like Adrian Newey as, right? Like if we like, is he? You know what I mean? Like he had, like literally, kind of is way above a technical director, but at the same time, like he has people underneath him that they all kind of oversee the car and they just report to to Newey, yeah. yeah. And then they they all kind of sit there and they make a consensus over what they should do, directions that they should go in. The thing with Newey is, is that he really gives his employees a lot of power 
to explore ideas. I think that's one of the things that makes him a good leader in that, that department is the fact that he allows his employees to just experiment, see where things go. And I think when you get to other F1 teams, you may not get that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things with Nui, right? Like when he was given free reign at, at Red Bull Racing, it was like, dude, do whatever you want. Just get us a fast car. And, <laughs> well, and, well, and that's why he's so great. Do. He also seems just like a really good guy. In the salacious rumor department, Tim, Lawrence Stroll is uh, purported to have made him an enormous offer last weekend. How true do you think that is? Uh, hard to say how, like, the... Um, That's Aston Martin's Lawrence the, Stroll, the, by the way. The truth to it. Like, I think Lawrence has... I, I think Lawrence has tried to, to go after Adrian a couple times. Uh, you know, maybe he did have a conversation with him during the... Whatever the report said, the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, I think it was or Australian Grand Prix. I can't remember which one it was the, that the report had said, but uh, you know, I, I have an understanding that he has, he has uh, gone after and spoken to Nui before in the past. Now, has he done it recently? I don't have an answer to that. I would assume not only because like we all know Adrian's probably not going anywhere. Like mm -hmm. it, it'd be really hard to pull him away from from that because i think like at red bull it's like he gets he gets like i said free reign to to do what he needs to do to to get the job done and i, I don't think money is an issue for him either like he's he's treated pretty good there so i don't know if that's some, i mean adam like you like any work environment like if you're treated well if you're given free reign you're paid well why do you need to go anywhere right like if i think it's similar things apply here but i mean we'll learn more as this week kind of carries out too because well you know aston martin's gonna be speaking to the media as yeah. well so we'll learn more <laughs> this will be good we will see well okay tim so uh later on this week we'll do like a bit of a race preview of suzuka okay. uh once uh i think it's always good to do on like thursday because then you get a sense of you know the drivers are there for media day on wednesday we're going to get a sense of what everybody's saying everybody's feeling it's been a couple of weeks and you know what the next few races we're going to have you know, weekends in between. Uh, so it's the, the next few races are a bit spread out, which is a bit of a bummer. As, as a race fan, you want them like back to back, but you can understand why. Um, and then, you know, Tim, we're going to get a Chinese Grand Prix for the first time in a long, long time. And people really like that track. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. It's a great track. If you haven't driven it on like F1 23, which I got a free copy of. It's the only reason. Because I, okay, Ooh. so here's, okay, so here's the thing. So Jesse... Jesse and I did a um, we did a race live streamed it on SDPN back in the summertime, and I hadn't been on or driven like a racing game since probably like two thousand and one, two thousand and two okay. Gran Turismo, and it had been oh, like man. forever since I actually like I drove like a form like a a racing video game. I never mm -hmm. I never do that. And a friend of mine was like, "Hey, F one twenty three is is free on um, the PS Plus store." And I was like, "Oh, right on! All right, I'll, 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 uh, I'll get this. I'll see what it's like. I mean, I may invest like ten minutes into the thing and be like, nah, this is junk.' Yeah. So I got it, and I was like, "Oh man, I'm kind of uh, hooked on it now. It's so, it's so much fun. fun. But it, yeah, but anyways, you can drive the the the, the Chinese GP track um, on it. And like, I had driven that track in a simulator like a long time ago, like a like an F1 sim, and." Uh, it was great in that thing. And like, I, I love that track. I can see why drivers really, really like it, Adam. It's really yeah. cool. And Suzuka's a pretty quick track, too. Oh, Suzuka's awesome, man. That's where an F1 car comes to life. Yeah. So this, these are the things that like, it's exciting to, it's exciting to, to have these kind of races on the horizon because they're great, great tracks. It's almost like when you're getting ready in the European leg for like Spa. Yeah. Right. Another great or yeah, Silverstone. Great, track. great tracks. Great you know track, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can see that in the video game too. I don't know, like you, you've played F one twenty. Oh yeah, F one games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you, buy them every year. Yeah, you can you can see that right when you go to like a street track, but then you go to like a like a like a full on road course where an F one car can do its thing. Like, yeah, you can see the difference even with the video game now, and that's oh. wild to me, right? Because I like like I was saying, like I'm like so far removed from playing video games with race cars. <laughs> now I'm doing it. I'm like, oh yeah, I can see the difference. This is really accurate. This is good. yeah. I can't stand Jetta or Monaco. Can't stand them. 
Like oh, it's just man, it's so you're so tight all the time. And then, like, if for, for at least in the video game, if you make it through qualifying, I never qualify well in those races in the video game. So, um, you know, I might qualify like 11th or something, and then you're stuck. Like, you can't get past anybody. I had to turn. I had to turn all of the assists. Like, I hate the assists. Like, I hate it. So I had to turn all of my assists are off. I don't. And so I run F123. Uh, not like a driver the, would. Yeah, I, but I run it not at the expert mode because you when I what I found is once you get to the very highest level of AI and difficulty, like you need a sit down rig, like you need yeah. a sim, you need a one of those Fantech uh, force feedback steering wheels, you need the, the the actual racing pedals, you need the racing seat, you need to feel the car move a bit, and I was just getting smoked. But once <laughs> I kind of took the difficulty down just a tiny bit and then removed it from the expert. Uh, to whatever the second the second most difficult thing was on it um just below expert anyways yeah, yeah. i'm trying to say but, like then it's like i i needed the assists removed i couldn't feel the car enough like i needed it to slide just a little bit because when you put all the assists on you can't i mean traction control in that game is a joke like you literally break downshift throw it in the corner and hammer on the gas and i'm like <laughs> There's no skill in that. Like, what the hell? I'm like, I actually, I want to be challenged here. Well, so. some of us, some of us peasants did not grow, grow up as race car drivers, and that's a lot for us. Okay, <laughs> especially that chicane out of the end, out of the tunnel in in Monaco. It's brutal. <laughs> awesome. I need, I need the assists. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, man. I love it. That's great. That's yeah, great. yeah. So listen, um, Tim, we're gonna be back in a couple days. We're gonna get rolling. We'll watch uh, all the drama unfold yep. as as always. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, let's get into it. Let's get let's get a race going. Yeah, hundred percent. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it, man.